when you do it right, when you're catering to kids in a city, how it can be life changing. So Genesis on that, that waterfall ride, she said, she was like, we were riding next to each other on the historic Columbia River Highway Trail. And she says to me, I never thought this would be my life. And I just look at her and I'm like, what are you talking about? And she's like, two years ago, I never thought I'd be riding a bike for fun or to get places. She joined the club and learned a bunch of like how to get places around town. Then the Free Bikes for Kids nonprofit called Anson's Bike Buddies that I help run got her this bike that she uses to bike to school every single day. Like she is the epitome of how a kid's life can be transformed. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Simmerman and that is Megan Ramey from Hood River, Oregon. She's back again. Uh, we're gonna get an update from her on all of her amazing things that she is doing in the city of Hood River uh, now that she is officially a uh, part of government, I guess, <laughs> as the Safe Routes to School Coordinator. Uh, it is a good one, but again, it's a long one. And this is the very last episode of season six. Uh, so let's get right to it with Megan. Megan, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast once again. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I'm so honored. I, I do say once again because you have been on the on the podcast uh, before. Uh, it was way back in season three. This was January of 2022, uh, and uh, I really appreciate you coming back on after just about two years to give a little update on everything that's happening there in Hood River, Oregon. Uh, but why don't you do this? Why don't you just take a moment to uh, introduce yourself uh, to the audience? Yeah, so my name is Megan Rainey. I'm joined by my unofficial uh, therapy cat, Kubo. Say hi, Kubo. I'm sure she'll like look at the camera a couple times, but um, I am the Safe Roots to School Manager for Hood River County School District, and i am uh, been a longtime bike advocate, and uh, mostly because I became a mother, and becoming a mother opened my eyes to... Uh, how unsafe our streets are. So yes, I, I'm really into like music and cooking and getting outdoors. And yeah, that's just a little bit about me. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. And, uh, and the safe routes to school manager role that you have is relatively new. Uh, you sent over this little clipping, uh, talk a little bit about that process because this is new from the last time you were on the uh, podcast. Yes, it's great to have that timestamp of January 2022 because right about then I was in the process of helping the school district apply for this grant uh, from ODOT to fund a permanent position for the school district. And I didn't, throughout the process, I didn't realize I was writing a grant to pay for a job for me, um, but I realized that in writing the grant, I was honest with the superintendent at the time and the team that, oh, I actually do want this job. And so maybe I shouldn't, uh, I should take a little step back. But yes, uh, it was uh, announced in May that uh, that we won the, the grant. And then the superintendent said, I would be crazy not to offer you the job. You've gotten so much done not getting paid. I can't wait to see what happens when you get paid. <laughs> yeah, so. When you get paid. And, uh, and we'll encourage folks to, to go back and watch uh, that first episode. And uh, we talked extensively about some of the activities that you were involved with, which included, uh, you know, the bike train slash bike bus, basically the same thing, you know, and uh, you had been doing that for a little while. We'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the the bike rodeos that you do. We'll talk a little bit about that demonstration project that you did. We'll talk a little bit about school streets. There's so much that we have to talk about. <laughs> it's going to be fun. Uh, so much. But but I first have to wish you a happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yay. It feels really good. I, um, I don't know. I've just been reflecting a lot this past year and I, I'm just, I'm really happy to be at the age I am. I still don't know what I want to do with my life. Like we're all, I'm still 
figuring it out, but I'm following the, I'm following the passion and the joy. So thank you so much. You are quite welcome. Yes, we, we are uh, recording this on December uh, 14th, uh, uh, and this is going to go live, by the way, I didn't tell you this yet, but this will go live on Friday, uh, December 29th. And so it will be the final episode of season six, and it will be the final episode of the year. Uh, so you have that honor of being there. Uh, but as, as you mentioned, you know, it's been, a, it's been a wild and crazy year. You've done a lot of amazing things, and you've run into a, a, a lot lot of amazing people and including uh you know some past guests on the podcast here <laughs> we see emily and sam as well T- talk a little bit about this gathering so this was the brooklyn bike bus tour for the vision zero conference and it was one of those uh i think for like at least two hours i was on the brink of um like pinching myself slash my arm hairs, like we're constantly going goosebumps and, um, and just getting very emotional because of this amazing group of people from all over the country that came together to see what Emily is doing in Brooklyn and just getting to meet Emily in person. Um, you, Uh, are very much responsible for this, John. Like she was inspired. She told me to my face that she was inspired by seeing the first Act of Talents podcast I did. And um, and it was just so wonderful to connect with her and and um, and then Sam, just the energy that he brings to this whole movement and community and to see um, folks from around the U.S., just um, be kind of in awe of him is it's always just I, I could just be um, a part of the congregation of San Balto and it would be a great time. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Who's the fourth person in the in the photo there? That's Vivian Ortiz. And she is so, so crazy because I um, had very little interaction with Vivian when I lived in Boston. Same with Sam. I never even met Sam until I moved to Pacific Northwest, but Vivian is a force in Safe Routes to School for Massachusetts and doing pretty fantastic things. She's also on the League of American Cyclists um, board. And so uh, this is this is a dream team. Uh, It is a dream team. I'm going to have to have her on the podcast, too. Yeah, she's uh, she's doing some some she and she was on the board of Livable Streets right after I left um, from from Boston, which is my uh boot camp for advocacy and yes yeah well we talked about that a little bit in the first episode you know you were there at the era when jonathan fertig was in that area and and all that so uh yeah and and that that kind of speaks a little bit to the power that we have as community members who you know just say hey i'm gonna roll up my sleeves and do something you mentioned sam you know he kind of caught a a tiger by the tail because he started posting stuff out on Twitter and TikTok and it just exploded. You just never know when one of these silly little podcasts that I'm putting together might, you know, inspire somebody to, to do something. And Emily has shared that story quite openly that, you know, she was inspired to do it by your first uh, episode. So, yeah, it gives you you know, chicken skin. <laughs> so. Yes, con- it was constant during this tour and, and then just having it felt like we had this like paparazzi (laughs) surrounding us with both uh, Jonathan Mouse from Bike Portland and Clarence from Street Films, and they were just capturing all of it. And yes, this is, I have to talk about this. This is Kyle Johnson in the center, and it's so appropriate that he's wearing a Mr. Rogers Neighborhood shirt in this picture. He's um, between uh, Sam and I. And so uh, Kyle started the first ever I'm calling it the first ever bike train bike bus in in the world, but there is. It's so interesting because there could be one in Germany, and and he inspired me with his appearance on Clarence's Street Films. Um, when I saw that, it was about neighborhood greenways in Portland, and he was interviewed as part of that. And I saw that uh, podcast, and I was like oh, that's what I'm doing. Like, that's a no-brainer. And so, 
Yeah. And so, yeah, just having the three of us together, this was a bike bus meetup in Portland. Yeah. Fantastic. That is so, so much fun. Yeah. So, I mean, you got to be pinching yourself of just how much has changed in the last two years. Yes. And in so many magnificent ways, like I, I, I keep telling people, I feel like I'm in this uh, cash grabbing machine where if you, if you do what you love, the money will follow. And it's not for me, it's for my community. And there has just been so much good that has happened in the past two years that, you know, I was just watching, I don't know if you've seen the crown uh, documentary and not documentary biopic, I guess is what it's called. And there is this moment, it's uh, the episode with uh, Princess Diana when, and I was never really a fan of, I, I just wasn't wrapped up in that world of royalty. But watching those final moments before she died, there was this um, fictitious interaction she had with, um, I totally forget the name of her boyfriend who'd also died with her, but she, he told her they were giving advice to each other and he said, you need to slow down and look at what you have accomplished in the past year. And you're still like trying to figure out what's next. And I just, I need to take, I like, I started crying during that episode because I was like, oh, she's like talking to me. <laughs> I like need to slow down and enjoy this moment because it's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting uh, that you say you need to kind of, you know, slow down and enjoy this moment. And you have had a little bit of an opportunity to to get out with the family and uh, explore and 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 enjoy the moment a little bit, uh, because you're right. You mean, you, you catch a tiger by the tail. You're you're doing this. You're doing that. Next thing you do, you we'll, we'll get to all the the demonstration project and all that. But now that you mentioned London and or, or you know the royalty and all that, and and uh, so w- we need to talk a little bit about uh, your trip that you did, and so uh, yeah, so you you put the family together and you grabbed your Bromptons, and you're part of the Brompton family. I also travel with my Brompton, as you well know. Talk a little bit about the the trip, and because the trip ended up being culminated with another bike bus gathering, uh, but before that, you guys were just out exploring. Well, the bike bus gathering the summit was the reason for the trip like that. Um, they, I, I believe it was Sam that just threw the idea out there that said, he said, let's just get together in Barcelona where it all started. And um, so I started planning from there. I was like, okay, I got to see, um, I can't wait to see Barcelona because this is all uh, so I have like two hats that I wear. One is the Safe Roots to School manager and the other is the founder of Bike About. And so I was like, I have to see as much of Barcelona and eat and drink and sightsee my way through it. But also I, you know, Paris is right there too. And I wanted to check up on London because I used to live there a long time ago. And that guide is now, so I write travel guides on how to sightsee cities by bike. And so the London guide is now live. Um, And then uh, just, so I was also, like, this is a tangent, but I was also a surrogate. I had a baby for a couple in the south of France. And Penelope was born in 2018 and then COVID happened. So I hadn't seen her since. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And so to be able to visit her in uh, the south of France and she was four going on five, just learning how to ride a bike. And I got to spend a really good time, some really good time with her. It's like our family tree kind of like was grafted with a new branch. Um, And so now... Um, but that's like, um, that's like a very, uh, personal visit that I attach to this whole trip. Yeah. Fantastic. And it, as you can see here, uh, folks, uh, and, and for the listening audience, we have pulled up, uh, Megan's bike uh, That's B I K 
about.com. Uh, and you can take a look at all of the different profiles that you have done. Uh, you've done bikeable uh, North American vacations, and there's a whole bunch of them on there. And of course, you've got London that is we're looking at at the moment. Uh, are you going to do one for Paris too, since you were in Paris? Yeah, Paris will be my next one, and that's a beast. I I have to wrap my head around. Um, yeah, Paris how is, to, is crazy now. <laughs> yeah, and and same with Barcelona. Honestly, those two cities, um, I had no prior visit there, so I had no reflection between my visits. London, I had a lot of reflection, but but yes, uh, those two cities are. Um, just doing amazing things in very different ways, but, but yeah, it was a, it was a pleasure to be able to bike around with my daughter. And you mentioned the Bromptons, um, that was the maiden voyage, voyage of her having her home Brompton. So going, going through the entire process. So she's always like, since she was nine months old, we visited Brooklyn by bike and she was in a burly trailer. So now she's on her own bike with us instead of being on. Yep. That's, that's Annika. And she's in a, she was in one of the protected bike lanes and um, that's her bike. And so she, so she got to do a custom paint job from like courtesy of spray dot bike, which is an amazing company. And she's carrying all of her luggage here. And so that's, that's how we got around is, folding these things up, putting them on the train. I have to give a shout out to this picture quick. So this is in London. And I don't know if anybody knows Travis and Sigrid, but they're uh, yeah, social media famous. Sigrid is a, a Norwegian. I forget what type of kitty, but she's a beautiful white cat. And my daughter, well, we all are cat lovers in this house, obviously, from Kubo sitting on my lap in the beginning. But it was a very big moment for my daughter here, Annika, to meet Sigrid. <laughs> and uh, she biked she biked to see us in the rain and she was cold, but she had her little rain cap with her hood on. And oh my gosh, it was just a joy to be able to meet. And Travis grew up in Stevenson, Washington, right across the river from, <laughs> from us. And so being able to meet him in London was just, it was, it was great. Um, yeah. Yeah. That is fantastic. Yeah. And you know, what a trooper she's, she's just like, boom, let's go. We're, we're, we do this. Yeah, this is on uh, no sleep um, because we uh, arrived in London that morning at like 7 a.m., took the Heathrow Express into town, into Paddington Station, which is a totally different experience than what I had. It only takes like 30 minutes to get from the airport to downtown now, where it used to take almost like an hour plus. But anyway, uh, we were uh, had the mission to stay up, see the city. It was one of the most rainiest days ever. We brought all of our rain gear, so we were fine, but it it did start soaking through. And this is a picture of Annika and my husband, Kyle, biking in um, one of the separated bike lanes next to Buckingham Palace. And so we had just watched all of the Crown series to that date. And so she had this background familiarity with the obsession with the royal family. Yeah, I love it. That's so great. And, and she, she's riding her bike for fun and for recreation a little bit these days too, right? Yeah, no, she, um, we only live about a quarter mile from the middle school. So she walks to school. She, uh, prefers walking and which I love. I, you know, like I, I'm a walk, I like walking around in Hood River cause it's so small and dense, but she, uh, knows how to handle herself in very highly nuanced city situations and um yeah here's us and the eiffel tower which was uh yeah i i could go on <laughs> about this whole trip but uh she she holds her own now more so than a lot of adults i've biked with and it's it's a um i feel like a proud a very proud mama that all those it's somebody asked about this on Twitter recently or X, whatever it is saying, like they're very much struggling with this transition where you go from, you go from the kids riding on your bike to them riding a bike next to you. Right. And I, I wanted to offer that mom comfort because it doesn't happen overnight, it happens very gradually over the course of five years and by necessity. And all of those 
investments in time with Annika. Here we are biking on the, this is right after the the cycle track on Western Avenue uh, in Cambridge. I spoke at the ribbon cutting and her and I biked away from it side by side as it should be for a mom and daughter. Like this is a gold standard in, in American bike infrastructure. And yeah, the, all these little investments of time and putting her on her own bike next to us has paid off. Like it is a joy to sightsee cities now. And it always has been, but it's like even more so. Yeah. And she's, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. She's also competing a little bit like in cyclocross. Yes. So she, uh, so for the first time, I don't believe at the last podcast, she was here yet, but uh, for the first time, she now competes in the same time bracket as me. So I get to race with her. And I always have said this. I look forward to the day where she starts to overcome me physically because I am I love my athleticism and I am competitive and I cannot wait until she gets to my level and starts pushing me. So she starts in a in a heat like right in front of me. And we always have this game of how long is it going to take for mama to catch up to Annika? And there was a race where (laughs) there was a race where I caught up to her and passed her. And I thought that was it. And she like passed me like 15 seconds later and held on in front of me for a whole lap. And I was just like having so much fun tailing her around. We were laughing and yes. So yeah, she also has that dual mind of recreational and transportation biking. Yeah, and I think that's really important. I, the reason I intentionally wanted to do that is because too often in the bicycle advocacy world, we see the different camps in the between recreational sport, you know, cycling versus utilitarian cycling. And it's just, there's no reason for it to be, uh, you know, at loggerheads and at a battle you know, you know this about me as well as, you know, I've got a whole garage full of bikes, you know, that are utilitarian in nature, you know, the cargo bike and the Brompton and the day-to-day bike, but then I also have my racing bikes. And so I, I love having that duality as well. And it's so wonderful to see that she's into that spirit and she has that joy of, of cycling and competing and having fun with mom. Yes, it's, um, I think we're so much stronger together. And it's like one of my missions to bring those two contingents together, because there are so many people who use their bikes for recreation that if they could just use their voice a little bit more, then USA Cycling would follow suit and start using their power to make it safer in the street, and we would all be better off. Yeah, yeah. In fact, you and I have not had this discussion, but when I first started uh, the nonprofit Advocates for Healthy Communities, my very first initiative was a, an initiative called Everyday Race Day. And uh, the reason why I called it that was it, the, the tagline was Everyday Race Day. Wouldn't it be nice if every day out on our streets and in our community felt like race day where the community was coming together and to applaud you as you rode your bike by? And oh, Yes. And and the, the origins of that particular initiative was uh, something we had done a few years earlier, a couple years earlier, uh, during Ironman in Kona, which is where I lived at the time. And uh, at, at the World Championships for Ironman, we had a, a nice little uh, booth and we called that initiative Everyday Race Day. And so we were introducing... Uh, the Ironman distance triathletes that would come by the booth uh, that, you know, the Ironman uh, organization was gracious enough to, to give us that booth space to, to be able to talk about bicycle advocacy. And we would have that discussion with these athletes. Uh, and, and in fact, they, we would ask, they, they, you know, they'd say, well, where, where are you from? And, 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 and they'd say, oh, we're from Boston. And so we would pull up the map on Boston and we say, your bike, local bicycle advocacy organization is this, and this is the contact information and, and get that to them because we wanted that engagement, you know, from them, or, you know, between them, like you said, the, the quote unquote different camps where they don't, they shouldn't, there shouldn't be different camps. It should just be, you know, we really should be advocating for, you know, any opportunity to get on a bike and have some fun. Yeah, it's so needed um, that what you did and it should be just part of 
any type of race registration for it that involves biking. Um, there should just be a link to the local partnership with the advocacy organization and Oregon Bike Racing Association, OBRA for short, and is starting to get there because we're starting to have cross-pollination between uh, cycle cross and, and advocacy. So, yeah. And I actually see this kind of blending over since I, I was a triathlete and we were, uh, you know, talking with triathletes, they're also out running, you know, on the streets too. And so, you know, really talking about street safety in a much broader term in terms of not just for safety for cyclists, but also safer for pedestrians as well. And so having these discussions and talking about safer streets advocacy and vision zero advocacy, uh, you know, includes not just people on bikes, it includes literally everybody on our streets trying to create safer places. Safer and more joyful too for runners because I just went I just went running like two nights ago. It was dark out, and the uh, my friend who I was running with we had to wait at least forty five seconds to cross the road, and so that's like one of those things where as a runner you just don't want to just sit there idling like waiting for the cars to like let you let you go. It was like a crosswalk. They should have been stopping for us. Yeah. Uh, I'm lingering on this particular photo of uh, uh, Brattle Street here, uh, 2014 uh, versus today. Talk a little bit about Brattle Street and why this is so special for you. This is special to me because I lived a quarter, not even uh, like uh, not even a quarter of a mile away from um, both these images. So we lived um, in eastern or sorry, western Cambridge, far western Cambridge, where it borders on Belmont. And uh, my daughter is on the left in the front. She's uh, riding her bike in a painted bike lane at the time, which was, you know, actually nice compared to the rest of Boston Metro at that time. But at that time, and she was one of the very few kids riding, she started riding her bike to school as like a pre-K at three years old on a balance bike. And here she is on like a, I don't even know what wheel size that bike is, but joined by one of her friends on a bike to school day that I led. And I always, I had such high hopes for Cambridge as being such a progressive city. Like there's like this joke of like, zip code 02138 is the most opinionated zip code in the country. But it was always my hope that we would start to see more kids uh, riding and being on their parents' bikes. And so fast forward now to just like when I just visited Boston this past time, uh, Petro Sufio, who's a uh, um, may I, you need to have him on your show. Uh, I, thank you. Thank you. I need to follow up with him and, and, uh, I'll mention to him that, uh, his name came up and I think he's, his, he's got, you've got a photo of him somewhere in here. Yes. Uh, yeah. And so I'll get, we'll, into we'll get that. him on. We'll get him on. I'll get into that story too, because he is an amazing human being who is, is anyway, I'll go into that, but he took me on a tour of the Brattle street, all the new by, I wanted to see like all the new bike lanes in town. And so he took me on this tour of the street and it's just it's so much better. Like I used to be a salmon going through Harvard Square. It was, I was going against two one way, like it was a one way of two lanes of car traffic because just to make the point, there needed to be a protected bike lane that was contraflow. And now it's there. And uh, it, this is a, such a marvelous, this again is a gold standard in biking bikeways. So I'm so proud of Cambridge. Yeah. And, it, it, and it's, it's worth saying too, because, you know, as, as you also mentioned earlier, uh, this, this earlier photo is also, uh, you know, part of the Cambridge uh, infrastructure that that is there in 2019, of course, the, uh, the Cambridge safety street law or safe streets law or whatever was passed. I don't know the exact name. Um, but yeah, for, for those that don't know, Cambridge, Massachusetts is doing some pretty amazing things. What we're looking at right here on screen and, and for the listening audience, this particular image is a continuous elevation bikeway, uh, which means that both the crosswalks uh, and the, 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 the bike 
walks or the bike crossings are all at the the uh, elevated level um, at the curb level and not at the street level and so that creates a raised crossing at each of those minor streets uh, that the cars are doing and what was really really wonderful to uh, to learn from the Cambridge city staff and I do have a video on this where they talk about how they were able to install those raised crossings through uh, a lighter, quicker, cheaper sort of approach. It's like an overlay of, of asphalt that they did and tested it out because they, they wanted to move quicker and, and get some stuff on the ground and test it out and pilot it. And in Western, it, it's been in for a while now. Yeah. Did, was that by chance with Kara? That's Spider-Man? Uh, I, Yes. Well, actually, that particular day wasn't. Uh, I was with Kara the day before, uh, but then uh, the the city staff that I was with that particular day, because I was filming um, a tour with NACTO at the at the time, and and Kara was was not able to attend that one. But yeah. Yeah, Kara is a early influencer on my advocacy. I was on the Cambridge Bike Committee, and she was our ringleader, and she uh, always was wonderful about um, pinging me whenever there was an important community meeting coming up that parents needed to show up and I needed to rally. And, and she's another past guest here on the, on the podcast too. So. Yay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's great stuff. I, I do want to get over to some of the, the things that, that sort of came about with the work that you were doing in safe routes. And I, I think that, Probably getting to that demonstration project uh, is is where I want to go next with this because it's one thing to be doing the bike buses and the bike trains and the walk to school days and all that. That's what I call the software uh, activity assets. These are the things that we do that are the policies and the procedures and the engagement activities and the awareness activities. It's completely different to uh, you know grab the bull by the horns and say, how do we get some infrastructure down on the ground? We were just talking about, you know, Cambridge there and the fact that they're building, you know, first class uh, infrastructure in, in their environment now and moving quite quickly. And the data is showing that it's having a difference. It's completely another to be like in Hood River, Oregon. And you're like, okay, we need help. And we talk a little bit about that in our first episode. So talk a little bit about this Safe Routes uh, school demonstration that you pulled together. Yeah, so this goes back about four years when I was just a mom advocate. Portland State University had a has a program called Better Blocks, and they want to help cities and towns uh, put in essentially like demonstrations or quick build infrastructure. And they want their students to get hands-on experience, engineering uh, students and planning students get hands-on experience, uh, helping cities and towns plan this. So I applied for the program on the city's behalf, <laughs> just submitted the application and didn't ask any uh, permission and we won it. And so COVID happened, kind of delayed it. But then we got started, I believe, right after the last time we talked, which was January 2022. And the students came and visited us. We observed uh, the student behavior around. And this was the middle school. um, Apologies, the Hood River Middle School. And the student, the PSU students observed the middle school students, what their desire lines were. Um, how we can make it safe to snap to the behavior of the students instead of trying to design a solution that wouldn't be adopted by them. And so they drew up a plan and the city of Hood River was excited about it because some other background, this whole demonstration was a solution to this chicken and egg situation where cities don't do anything about the streets because they don't have magically a million dollars to play with. I wanted them to take a baby step and raise some public support for projects like this so they could see, oh, people actually do want this stuff, even though I know that so many parents want it, they still don't really quite have a grasp on that yet. So 
instead of, so the city applied for two grants uh, for this exact area. One was for $800,000 and one was for $1.2 million. And that was just to create a painted bike lane and a sidewalk in some missing parts. And they, ODOT denied them the grant. And I was like, okay, we got to break the cycle. And so that's why this demonstration was uh, so needed. And so, okay, where do I start? <laughs> so yeah, so four, so yeah, four years ago, we got the design, then the city was like, we need the funding. So I started applying for um, a, a grant, got it funded, and it was a partnership. It was a grant that included an after school club, which we can talk about. Um, I wanted there to be a good marriage between the students and their engagement with the process, but also and have them see the demonstration go down and engage the students along the way. So that's what the original grant was for. ODOT came to me actually the week before I left for the Europe trip, which is March, and said, we can't fund the demonstration materials because NHTSA or whoever it's called, the National Highway Safety, they were like, we can't fund infrastructure. And so I had to pivot within three days and try and find a magical $5,000 to help fund the demonstration materials, which we ended up using Zekla. That's a whole nother story. And uh, I would say it was like three or four grants that we ended up getting to fund this $12,000 demonstration. So there was, I think, I think funding was one of the biggest barriers. But after I got that, the city was on board, I would say 90%. And then there was one more hiccup. The week before, again, I was applying for grants, but the week before I left, my my awesome partner, Jonathan, with the city said, we need to pull a rabbit out of a hat. And I was like, what are you talking about? I'm leaving on vacation in four days. He's like, we need full design drawings in like by the time you leave because the public works manager is uh, retiring and we need to get this in front of him before he goes. And I'm like, okay. And I got off the phone. I almost had a panic attack because I was like, there's no way I can deliver. And so yes, Petru to the rescue. (laughs) Holy cow. So I put it out on what I call my task rabbit, which is Twitter and was like, can somebody help me? I can pay. Uh, Petru answered my call. He talked to me for 30 minutes about what uh, he saw the PSU design. What did I actually need? He said, well, I have to take the SATs on Saturday morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So pause just so pause just a second. Yes, I need to take the SATs. Yes, Petro is a teenager. Yes, he's a senior in high school. And he, I was like, of course you need to take the SATs. <laughs> take whatever time you want. And, but I'm not joking. Saturday morning, he took the SAT. Saturday afternoon, I had the full design drawings. This guy is like, not only does he have like a heart of gold, he's an advocate, but he's a brilliant engineer who just, I I joked with Peter Kuntz, who's an all, like an amazing engineer in uh, Portland area that, you know, he's going to have whatever job he wants to. And he's like, Oh, he's going to be running our DOT, um, like our federal DOT. And I, I, people, a kid, like he's not a kid. He's like, I mean, he's a high schooler, but he gives me so much hope for the next generation when I know how much talent and heart is out there. Yeah. And, and, and he's not new to this game. I mean, he got passionate about, Safe Streets advocacy work uh, a couple of years ago, several years ago. And uh, yeah, he's quite the savant in, in this area, for sure. Biking around Cambridge with him was like, it was like my brain on steroids in terms of, I used to time all the signals to not have to stop my bike. He is like that on like, a savant degree. It was wonderful being able to like, listen to his like inner monologue, like, Oh, that light's about to change. We can go. And I'm like, Oh, this is wonderful. (laughs) So he put together this design and it was like more than sufficient for the city of hood river. And, uh, he saved this demonstration project. I, it was not going to happen unless we had this. And so 
he, um, in addition to, um, he became busy towards the end of the project. We needed some more little design work and another Twitter bike, Twitter, uh, person, Robert Cole, who's also an engineer, ended up coming to my rescue again later on in the project. So this was truly a, a crowdsourced from America uh, project for me. And I would not have been able to do it without all this help. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the status now on that pilot? Because it, 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 ran itself out and then what happens and what will happen hopefully in the future? Yeah. I don't know if you can show the YouTube video of the uh, project maybe um, on mute, but it was installed in, um, in August during a hundred degree heat. Shout out to my public works guys who worked through that heat to get it installed over about a course of a week. He, that, so it was installed, um, it was always going to be uh, three months, we got a late start because of supply chain issues. And so it ran its course. And it was, it was a great project. Okay, so, so yeah, it was, um, it was a, a two way protected uh, side path, um, according to the uh, is the rural highway design guide, which is brilliant for small towns. And I've, um, t- I've taken so much good infrastructure recommendations from that. So it was a side path that you can, um, also walk and bike on and you can see some of it here. This is my after school club. Who's, uh, I love them. They're like such energy for me, but we're on the, um, demonstration right after it was removed. And that's why you see the sad face with Corbin. And uh, we're essentially here. It's like a, um, a weekly interview uh, called Deep Thoughts Thursday, uh, inspired by Jack Handy from Saturday Night Live, where I interviewed these uh, kids and asked them what their impression was on the demonstration, because I wanted to capture their thoughts so our leaders could see, like, if it was kids in charge, this thing would have stayed in. Um, and it really does make a difference in their lives. They couldn't articulate, uh, they would articulate a lot. Like I would say 95% of them said it keeps us safe from cars. Um, as you can see in the background there, um, they have their own space. And that's what they said. They, we have our own space now. It feels, they said it feels faster. It feels um, more convenient. I can talk to my friends. Um, What came through on the interviews, but they never said, was the social dynamic, how they could walk side by side. There was somebody from the school board I presented on the demonstration. Somebody from the school board that was like, said it made her day to see the kids like walking or biking in groups um, because she realized how valuable that was before and after school to get them um, to get them more socialized for the school environment, especially after COVID when there was so much isolation and they didn't know how to talk to each other. So it was like this, it was like a, um, I don't know, like Starbucks on our street, like a community gathering space that connected people and in it, and even the students that didn't use it, like they were honest, like I've never used it. They all said, it makes me happy to see a safe place for my, my fellow students. Um, yeah, here I am reading one of the deep thoughts poems that I closed with every, and it was a way to make myself laugh um, and not take myself too seriously. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's great. But I never answered your, I never answered your question to like where are we at right now. Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Where are we at right now? So with the demonstration, it was removed. And uh, so Halloween was the last day and that was super symbolic. And we planned that because Halloween is not only one of the deadliest uh, days for children because of uh, road safety issues, but it's also a time where kids can claim the streets and have joy. So we wanted that last day to be Halloween. And then the next morning, I, we were riding our bike to the bus stop to go uh, on our uh, vacation to Boston and they were taking it out. And it was, I knew it was coming and I had, I, you know, I had to feel a lot of questions about the fact that it was temporary and it was always, 
the plan, but when you see it actually going out as kids are biking in it, it's, it was really hard. And then it's so funny, simultaneously the same day, um, bike, uh, loud Portland was actively standing in front of a machine that was removing a bike lane. Yeah. And so it was so crazy to see the juxtaposition between Hood River and Portland on the same morning. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's run its course. We got some amazing data and surveys and we're presenting to city council next month about what are, where do we go from here? What are the lessons learned? How can the design be tweaked? And what is, what is the permanent solution for our community and for these students? And I can tell you that one of the city councilors is going to be, I mean, there's going to be a lot of cheerleaders on city council, but one, especially he took time out of his mornings to volunteer and go do counts and observe behavior at least 10 to 15 times. And so it's wonderful to have that ally on council. He knows how cheap it was and how easy it was. And so now he's like, he, I think he's going to be a big advocate for demonstration projects going forward around the city. Yeah. And, you know, I guess there's a good lesson here too, especially from the previous experience of the city applying for the grants for the, the big, big ticket items and not getting approved for them is that we don't have to wait for a boatload of money to be able to do something lighter, quicker, cheaper. Let's get something out there. Let's test it, pilot it. And you can even do interim materials like the Zeklas here, uh, as well as the, the flex posts and other types of designs uh, that, you know, can be, you know, preserving that real estate for future implementation with concrete, with, you know, the, the fancy stuff that we saw there in Cambridge. Yes. Um, yeah. It's so it's not, it's not rocket science. Um, it's just, it's, it's so much, uh, more of a prudent way to install infrastructure because you get real time feedback from the community, especially people that most people can't look at a rendering and understand how that's going to affect their daily lives. This is like, this, uh, project was $12,000 simultaneously. There's a big um, streetscape design project going on with the city of Hood River that I think costs $600,000 just for the plan. And so I get that, that was, that's a necessary plan that needs to happen, but I get a little frustrated when we keep, we're just planning fatigue all the time. And why can't we just get something in the ground? I want to give a shout out on this, on that video was uh, city councilor Gladys Rivera, who's our first uh, Latinx anything on city council. And she's, uh, she's a fantastic friend and ally. And I really appreciate all of her, all of her time on this. Yeah. I mean, and and that, that's really important that you point that out is you do need to have allies within city leadership on city council and the mayor, et cetera. You need to have that interaction that takes place, uh, because ultimately, the city leaders, if they do put their neck out and, and decide to do something and, and go something, we know the haters are going to come out. We know that they're going to come out and, and complain because change is, is very fear inducing. And so having them on board will help them, to, especially when they know how much the community appreciates and loves something like this and that it is, in fact, very valuable it gives them that backstop of knowing, okay, the community has got my back. I'm going to be able to have this level of political will to actually see this through. Yes, that's exactly it. It's like giving them the the courage, the energy, the, uh, the positive way to frame the issue. And you can't argue with childhood safety or joy. I mean, it's like impossible to come up with an argument against it. And this whole, what you just said reminds me so much of this quote that I keep in the back of my head. Uh, Chris and Melissa Bruntlett have given me so many gems over the years. One is, um, and I'm not going to do justice. They always have such a great way with words, but they say, stop wasting your time on uh, bad faith arguments from people that don't want to see a project happen. Focus on the leaders that believe in you and believe in the vision and you will go somewhere. And it's like, totally I'm paraphrasing it, but that's, 
that's what I do now. I like, I focus on the leaders, the positive and ignore, um, the bad faith. I mean, I, I love taking criticism from people that are want to move forward, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. Chris is, is uh, famous for saying, yeah, all of those excuses of, Oh, it's too cold here. It's too hot here. It's too hilly here. Those are all examples of some of those bad faith arguments that are there. Now, earlier you had mentioned as part of this was pulling together a club. Uh, this is so freaking cool since I'm a kid of the eighties. Uh, talk about eighties walk and roll club. Yeah. So I, um, so my principal at the middle school, I told him my idea to do a partnership club with the demonstration and, you know, of course I get into like wonky, wonky urban planning and transportation, uh, training. And he's like, you got to work on your sales pitch, Megan. These kids like won't even, like they have a hard time recruiting kids to the robotics club. So I was like, okay, I'm on it. And then it just suddenly like the light bulb went off. Like they are all completely infatuated with Stranger Things. And one of the critical elements of Stranger Things is the fact that they ride bikes around and they're problem solving and they go on adventures. And that harkens back. There's so many good articles written about this to Goonies and E.T. And, um, and Steven Spielberg. And it's just, that was like the light bulb moment. I was like, okay, I need to frame this as we're going to take adventures around town. And, yeah. um, and I love the mixtape in here too. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just the eighties boom box. I mean, uh, yeah, music is music is my religion. So I had to infuse that And it actually. So what we do with the eighties walk and roll club is, Every we meet twice a week and we I ask them in the beginning, what are their favorite spots around town within like a mile? And I put together a Google map of all of their favorite places. And these are like places like bakeries. That's actually in Portland where we took a field trip. But I I can talk about that where we go all over town and it's just like silly little things like they want to play in this water or have popsicles. We go get popsicles from like the grocery store and it's kind of like choose your own adventure. We did yoga in the middle of like a, this is going to be a future trail one day. And so I like to say through fun, I am uh, very subversively teaching them transportation etiquette. And they actually listen when I talk to them about very highly nuanced laws, like this, the rolling stop law, or the fact that we can bike in a crosswalk, but you need to bike at walking speed. So when it comes time to actually learn, they are there. The summertime, the club um, went through the summer and we had four hours together instead of two. So I was able to pair my love of taking bikes on transit. So we took our bikes on the bus and went all over the gorge and they saw waterfalls they'd never seen before. So we did transit bikes to trailheads and then hiked. And so it was like the trifecta of all adventures. Um, this is bridge of the gods. They're posing underneath. And it was right uh, on this trip. Exactly. Actually that uh, Genesis who's in the bottom, right. And she's like an OG member of the club from last January, she, her life has been completely transformed by the club. And I'm going to start getting emotional again. People have said, <laughs> I wrote this article. This article is based on the presentation I gave at the Vision Zero conference um, on uh, Kid Cities just this past uh, October in New York. And I wanted a powerful story to tell about how when you do it right, when you're catering to kids in a city, how it can be life changing. So Genesis on that, that waterfall ride, she said she was like, we were riding next to each other on the historic Columbia river highway trail. And she says to me, I never thought this would be my life. And I just look at her and I'm like, what are you talking about? And she's like, two years ago, I never thought I'd be riding a bike for fun or to get places. And it's, it's just a lot of fun. And I just, I got, I had to look away because I got really emotional. And, you know, she, I saw her, I first met her in fifth grade when she was in my bike rodeo. When I got that first, first ever grant, it was like $20,000 to do bike rodeos. Then she joined the club 
and learned a bunch of like how to get places around town. Then the Free Bikes for Kids nonprofit called Anson's Bike Buddies that I help run got her this bike that she uses to bike to school every single day. Like she is the epitome of how a kid's life can be transformed. So, um, so yeah, this is my bike. <laughs> this is, this one is of your the bike best. and it, this is your bike with a whole bunch of donation bikes for this, this bike program. Yeah. So, uh, Anson's bike buddies, I get to ask, uh, I get to raise my hand and, class and be like, okay, who rides their bike to school? And I get a few hands. Okay. Who needs a bike at home? And I get a ton of, a ton of hands. So I get to deliver bikes to these kids. Um, and, and yeah, so womb, we got a, another grant. I, I can't even tell you how many grants I've gotten. Uh, it's up to like $11 million now working with partners, but to fund all of this, is um pa- let's pause on that just a moment because you had mentioned it earlier you it almost feels like you're a cash machine bringing the, the money in it's cash just, grabbing machine <laughs> grabbing machine it's important to to point out that you know try try again it's like you know the city they applied for a couple they didn't get them and you're like okay that doesn't work we got to find a way to make it happen you made it happen you're continuing to um you know apply for grants, get engaged, get involved. You rolled up your sleeves. We talked about this two years ago. You just got, you know, you know, be in your bonnet or whatever. And you wanted to roll up your sleeves and get going and get involved and get engaged. And you did. And there's money out there to be had. You just have to take the initiative, go through the steps and the hoops. And yes, money always has strings attached. It's that's the way it goes but it's worth going after it. So I just wanted to emphasize that it's out there. You just have to go after it. It is so out there, especially for this type of work. I mean, there's not just foundations, but all of our state DOTs recognize how between electric bikes and this ground, this new type of, I'm going to call it the second wave of safe routes to school where we're doing more than just, yes, the walk and roll to school days. It's like you need to go beyond that to actually address the barriers with walking and biking to school. And so I find these these grants come across my desk. I never turn them away unless like even I sometimes have 24 hours to apply for one, which just happened with a specialized grant and we'll see if we win it. But I'm waiting on two grants right now to see if we won Um, But I never turn them away. Even if I'm not the one to fill it out, I will put together a rough draft of what the grant application should be. I send it to the agency that should apply for it. And then it's in their hands to say, we can't do it. Um, But most of the time, it's just that little baby step of giving them the idea that they can win it. And now it's like, now Hood River understands that they're worthy of money and investment and why it's needed. And it's like they, it's like I finally woken up like a, a beast. And I'm so happy that these different agencies are realizing that it's important to invest in this type of work. Yeah. And part of what's so inspiring about, um, the story of, you know, of, of her saying, you know, this has really, you know, changed my life. I'd never imagined my life would be like this is the fact that not only is it just fun that she's having fun, but it's about empowerment and it's about, you know, hopefully they're able to go beyond the, the club and, and get out there and, and, and do things, you know, on their own and have that sense of, of, you know, exploration and doing things on their own. And I love the fact that you're sort of, you know, engaging with the kids and saying, well, who needs a bike at home? (laughs) You know, and it's like, because we know that this is so incredibly empowering for being able to create free range kids and being able for them to have that sense of self-efficacy and self-confidence within themselves that they can navigate on their own. Yeah, just in watching this video of the kids biking in the street, um, 
I, so I went to this, uh, one of the best workshops I've ever been to in my life was about uh, behavior change with Doug Mackenzie Moore, who is like the godfather of behavior change. And the way he breaks down how you address barriers and um, get to the behavior that you're looking for, that's the, that's kind of the methodology, uh, methodology I approach with Safe Roots to Schools, like okay, we need to see what all the barriers are. And then one by one, I'm going to knock them down. It's like um, kind of like whack-a-mole. And there are so many. In transportation, that's why it's so interesting is because I think it's the hardest behavior change to address. And But through these kids who so want to be um, connected to each other and out in the street, like the high school... Um, a uh, teacher just reached out to me and said the number one goal of the teenagers she works with that are first bound or first, what is it called? Uh, first generation college bound. Um, their number one goal is to get outside. And so we're going to create um, a club e-bike for them where I get to take high schoolers on e-bikes around just like this. Yeah. Yeah. So your name has come up a couple of times recently in talking about the the challenge and the opportunity uh, that we have with regards to, I think, a really interesting trend that that you know just sort of popped up, uh, and I don't want to say it just sort of popped up, but it it really kind of emerged, and we're like, holy moly, we're seeing middle schoolers and teens out on e bikes like crazy, and it's got a lot of people very very concerned because. They're understanding, oh my gosh, this is mobility, this is freedom, and I can get around the town. Just like we, we were just talking about is that sense of, of self-efficacy and being able to get around and explore and they don't have to rely on their parents. But at the same time, with the, the new e-bikes that are coming out, especially with the throttle, not just e-assist, but with the throttle, suddenly we have a motor vehicle where it's like got a lot of people in the bicycle world, especially bicycle advocacy world, very, very uncomfortable. But you really leaned into it and I'll let you take it away from here. Yeah, so um, credit again to Chris Bruntlett for giving me this gem of a, a metaphor. I, he was at, uh, and I'm talking about the Teach Them to Fly, the title of my presentation I gave at the Safe Routes to School National Conference. Um, so... I was talking to Chris about this topic and it's so nuanced. It's like one of those things where you're just like, uh, when I see the kids go by and, um, so the double riding thing, um, has been happening in Hood River for about four years. You see them go by and it's just like, oh my gosh, the Netherlands is here. Finally, like we're, we're doing it. But unlike the Netherlands, these kids are going upwards of 25 miles an hour. Um, and so it's a it's a very it's different. Um, but anyway, so I was talking to Chris about it and telling him that a lot of people want me to teach them abstinence or teach them or essentially to shut it down. And he's like, no, why? No, don't cut their wings. Teach them to fly. And I was like, yes, that's so brilliant. So. There is a path forward with this amazing opportunity, but it involves many different stakeholders uh, working together. It's uh, yeah, education first. So they never have had education on, on bikes. And so this is a great opportunity to actually give them bike education, whether it's on acoustic or electric bikes. And, um, but then also the manufacturer, the design of the bikes themselves and the laws that inspire creativity and new um, adaptation in e-bikes. So right now, I still don't have the answer to this question. It drives me crazy. Are class two throttle e-bikes the cheapest ones because it's easier to make a throttle class two e-bikes or does that what the manufacturers think that everybody wants? So that's what they're making. Um, so I am in the camp of um, we're in Oregon right now. There's um, you have to be 16 to ride an e-bike, which is not happening. It's the Wild West. There are so many 10 to 15 year olds riding e-bikes as they should be because 
they don't have a car, but I want them to be riding essentially pedal assist bikes, so class one. And right now the law prohibits them from even doing that, which means that the manufacturers won't uh, catch up and design teen appropriate e-bikes. So it's like, again, this like downward spiral we're in where it could be rapidly changed with just a law adjustment. And I think it's very valuable for kids to learn how to ride regular acoustic bikes and then they get up to ride pedal assist. And yeah, this is me um, in front of our, our legislature in Oregon trying to get them to understand how e-bikes um, solve a ton of problems. And uh, I wanted them, or we all, a ton of us wanted them to take a e-bike incentive or rebate seriously. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think it's going to happen this year because of our law issue, uh, because there are representatives out there that don't want to vote for an e-bike rebate until the um, the kids on e-bikes thing is figured out. So she's proposing, Rep. Levy from Bend um, is proposing a, a law adjustment. So this is my daughter, Annika. She's- uh, Breaking the law, like, breaking the law. <laughs> breaking the law. And I'm proud. And like, I proudly right. admit that she is, she's breaking the law here because- Okay, so this law. happened. <laughs> yes, it's a stupid law. And this is a pedal assist, um, a big bucket bike by Urban Arrow. We've had this since 2016. And it's just an amazing machine. It's a car replacement. You see my 88 Forerunner behind, which always sits in the driveway. So Annika came to us on the day before, a couple days before Thanksgiving, it was the weekend. And she was like, I want to go get some ingredients to make. I forget. Oh, it was a dessert for Thanksgiving. And I was like, would you mind picking up other things for Thanksgiving? And she's like, okay. And she put together her whole shopping list. We got the Urban Arrow ready for her. This was not her first time riding the Urban Arrow. She's actually, she's uh, driven, driven. I don't that's the right word. She's driven my husband around it on Father's Day. She's driven me around on it. And so she has uh, good bike handling skills and I have full confidence that she's fine. She went to the grocery store by herself, picked up all the groceries for Thanksgiving and came back. And it was just like one, again, one of those like little transitional moments where you're like seeing a, a, a child grow into a resilient, competent adult. And this is what we should be breeding in America right now, especially given these kids are going to have uh, so like a profound challenge with climate change and being able to take care of themselves. And they need to see uh, a bike as a tool to take care of themselves and to be happier doing it. Yeah. Yeah. We've covered a lot, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you really want to leave the audience with this episode? Hmm. I would say school streets and um, and how this is not a a big city issue. Um, yeah, I, I like that. I like that. Bring that back around because so many, so often. When we're talking about these types of things, they think it's, oh, it's Boston. Oh, it's Portland. Oh, it's Austin. You know, it's Amsterdam. You know, is that what you mean by it's not just a big city issue? Yeah. So I, I wear, um, so I, I really love big cities, but I also chose to live in Hood River for a reason because I needed access uh, to the outdoors. And so I would say small towns um, are where so much love is needed right now. Um, and this is, um, safe routes to school can affect, uh, these children in such a, a, such a profound way. So like a good example, um, I now have five elementary schools that I work with and three or two of them are in situations where I would say most kids live like two miles outside of town. So they don't really have an opportunity to bike to school. They take the bus. But on the days where we do have walk and roll to school days, I have them meet me at a, a landmark that's near their school to showcase the barriers that those kids have when they can walk or bike to school. Like there's a good video that um, is in my walk and roll folder if you want to show, but I had, um, Odell, Oregon, which is like less than 3000 people 
Um, we all walked to school together from this park and there was over a hundred kids um, and parents walking on a truck highway. Um, this is actually Cascade Locks, which is also a very rural, small, small town community. And these kids are just like so jazzed about being able to bike to school. And um, they have one of the highest uh, low income rates in, in the country. Um, and they are so excited about being taught how to bike to school and in class and but also these walk and roll to school days. Um, but Odell, Oregon, um, I'm in the process of waiting to see if we got a grant to create a crosswalk. They don't have any sidewalks or crosswalks in their town. And they're still so excited about walking to school, like over a hundred of them walking along a truck highway to show their support for it. And I use those images in my grant application. We'll see. It's the Governor's Highway Association. Yeah, this is the video of them walking. And this was such a such a special day because the whole it's like I felt like almost all, all of Old Al was out there walking with these kids uh, to school in no infrastructure, like zero. And these are the same kids that when I take them for a bike ride to celebrate what they learned in their bike rodeo, they are like, we are free. Um, I forget what they are. Oh, Viva la America. They just like say all these things from behind me that like, I realize the untapped potential in rural towns and how we, how we need to invest in them. Yeah. 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 It, it's amazing too how much can be done. And this is a little bit along the lines of the spirit of bike bus is what you're really doing is you're just sort of getting out there and taking over the street um, and kind of reinforcing that we've allowed our streets to become so hostile to people. And so when we do come in and we retake the streets, you know, streets are for people and it's so empowering and so inspiring, you know, especially for the kids when they're like, oh my gosh, I love this. I'm with all my friends and we're going to school and we're doing it in the middle of the street. Yes, it's the most powerful advocacy tool to see kids in the street. Like they not only understand that they have a claim to it and whereby they're asking their teachers the following days after these events, like, when are we going to do this again? Because it was so much fun. But then also adults, it's like a, a fog is lifted from eyes where they like, oh, this is what's possible and this is what we need to be fighting for. So it's, yeah, it's, 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 you know, harkens back to the critical mass movement, but it's, um, but it's in a more like joyful, positive way. Yeah. Now we have a picture and especially for the, the listening only audience here, we have now have a photo of a school street barricade and really the school streets movement is just taking off internationally uh, right now paris is is building school streets uh, by the hundreds uh in london uh they've done the same and, and really explain for the audience that may not be you know super super up on the the terminology what is a school street uh school street is a a place to open it's like essentially the open streets movement but just in front of schools to give those uh give that space to the children who are uh walking and biking to school and giving them an opportunity to connect before and after school so um a lot of school most school streets have like this kind of semi-permanent um barricade where local residents and school staff or delivery vehicles or whatever need, if they need to be able to drive around it, they can, but it restricts through traffic, meaning drop-offs like school drop-offs, because what we have found it, again, it's this chicken and egg thing where parents are like, I don't want to, um, I want to drive my kid to school. So I know that they're safe from other cars, but they themselves are making the street unsafe for the kids who walk and bike to school. So what we have found with uh, our, we've done four school street pilots now, and this is actually going to be my, what I, what's my next demonstration project is. Um, hopefully we can get this in the ground for Earth Day through the end of this year. But 
This specific school has had some tremendous challenges with congestion, so much so that the neighbors are calling the police. Um, they are, they're tired of the congestion. They're tired of not being able to walk out their door and leave their driveway because the street is completely clogged up with cars. And so their neighbors are now asking, and so are the parents that walk and bike their kids to school. They say it's just kind of gotten out of control. So, but what we found with installing a school street is even the parents who drop off their kids love it because they can drop them off literally at this barricade, watch them walk down the street, don't have to worry about a car hitting them and are and they save all that time. And so it's it's a win for everybody and school streets are are super it's again, it's this light infrastructure that has such a rapid effect and so much so that people take it for granted when I, when the school street goes in, the parents are like, Oh, we thought that was going to be happening like all the time. This is, this was just a one day thing. And I was like, yeah, unfortunately we need to work things out with the city to make it more of a semi-permanent issue. Yeah. 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 But school streets are, I can't recommend them enough. I know it's it's hard to uh, figure out placement of them because every school is different, especially if you have like a neighborhood-based school, like where it's surrounded by homes and neighborhood streets is, is the easiest. But sometimes it's like your my middle school is on an arterial street and we can't just shut down that street. So um, there's got to be, uh, you have to really put some brain effort into designing school street well megan once again thank you so very much for uh joining me here on the active towns podcast and uh, and once again happy birthday i you know when when we realized that this was going to be your birthday uh for this uh recording we were both excited because uh it's so much fun to celebrate with you I can't imagine um, celebrating my birthday in a better way. This is uh, this is wonderful, John, and uh, you. Um, I want to thank you personally for what you are doing for our world. So it's it's a podcast like this that that are it's making everybody have like both the light bulb moment, but also the energy to actually do something. So thank you. Mm-hmm. You are quite welcome and right back at you. And uh, I can't wait to uh, catch up with you. And in fact, I need to come and bring the Active Towns tour to Hood River, Oregon and get some uh, profile videos in person. So we'll have to make that happen perhaps in 2024. Yeah, there might be an event in 2024 that will draw you here, but I can't talk about it yet. Okay, keep me posted. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Megan Ramey. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content uh, here on the Active Towns channel, uh, please consider supporting my efforts as an Active Towns ambassador. It's easy to do. Just head on over to the Active Towns website at activetowns.org and click on the support button. And again, this is the last episode of Season 6. I'll be back in January for the kickoff of Season 7. So until then, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.